Kitco Mining special coverage of Resourcing Tomorrow is brought to you by Discovery Group. Hello and welcome to Kitco Mining with me, Paul Harris. We are at Mines and Money in London and today we're talking about carbon, carbon emissions in general, and I'm joined by Mark Fellows, founder and CEO of Scan Associates. Good morning, Mark. Hello, Paul. Let's talk carbon. Um, the coal has come in from the cold this year due to the energy crisis in Europe, which is obviously slowing humanity's decarbonisation efforts at a time when uh, prior to that, the diversified miners were moving away from thermal coal um, to sort of transition their portfolios to be, more, um, to be more responsible and to meet the humanity's goals of reducing carbon and complying with the Paris Agreement, the 1.5 uh, degree target. Um, is the energy crisis really dinging the mining sector's efforts here? It is, um, but maybe not necessarily directly mine by mine. So if you look at where significant mining operations are distributed globally, Europe, which has been the direct um, kind of, uh, which, helped, which, is, which has been suffering the most direct impact from what's gone on in Ukraine, um, is not a big mining um, location. But obviously these are global markets, so the impacts have been felt on oil and natural gas. Um, ultimately those feed through into fuel prices. So we've seen significant cost inflation happening, which is not our, at Scarn Associates, not our primary um, concern, if you like. We're much more interested in energy use and carbon emissions. But it, it, what it means is that the whole global energy system, supply chain, is um, overstretched and consequently behaving in a way that is not normal, if you like. So we're seeing um, certain kind of stress responses and that's why we're seeing coal become a bit of a, a backstop in, um, in the energy market. Uh, and to, to some extent also oil and gas. Um, and I think mainly though, the pressure has been felt financially um, at the mine by mine level, and that's a global impact. But I'd also point out that the conflicts had a massive um, effect on say the value of the dollar and of local currencies against that. Again, that has a huge impact on the economics of the sector. So all of these things are very um, intimately related um, they have an impact on um, profitability, on margins, um, and also on the ability to raise finance. So yes, it has an impact. Um, I, I think though that we're on a very long, gradual pathway towards decarbonisation in the sector. And in um, the rearview mirror, this will probably look like a blip. Um, as we go on that trajectory down towards 2030, 2050. If I can sort of be devil's advocate for a moment, Mark, the higher energy prices, um, miners are very focused on their, their scope two emissions, which is the energy and fuel and things of that nature. With higher energy prices, is that forcing miners, I mean, miners like justifying their investments because they, they make economic sense, do the right thing, but it's got to make economic sense. So with higher hydrocarbon prices, energy prices, is that forcing miners to accelerate their plans or look to accelerate their plans to, to change their energy matrix, to be less exposed to that kind of we stuff? We are at parity um, in terms of, of, of cost now um, when it comes to the decision between installing um, renewables or sticking with conventional hydrocarbons. So if you have a new project uh, and you're looking at how you're going to feed energy into that, Right now, in many jurisdictions, it, it, it really has started to make sense to consider um, sourcing your electricity via a power purchase agreement if it's, if it's on the grid. If it's off the grid and you have the right um, local conditions, looking at solar and wind and the battery. And we're right now at, at, at pretty much at price parity with those things. And that's one of the key indicators of a tipping point in any kind of technological um, change. You have this idea, I've been talking quite a lot about this recently, um, but you have this idea of the S-curve where 
along the bottom part of the S curve where we're still in a very early stage with the new technology, whatever it is, um, it takes quite a while for um, you to get to a minimum level of adoption, uh, a level of um, price um, parity whereby it makes sense to switch over to the new technology. But once you get past that point, there's a massive acceleration in terms of the way that the new technology supersedes the old. And that's really, we're really at that point where the S-curve starts to get really steep now with things of like wind and solar. Uh, and I think one of the main factors delaying that, that switch over is obviously mines get built, a lot of money gets invested in their um, infrastructure. And to actually um, then swap that out for a new energy solution is not necessarily going to make economic sense. Certainly really the mines with a, a very long life that can do that because they have to renew their fleet at some point anyway. And you need a long life mine. So there's been a really interesting example recently down in Australia with the Bellevue Gold Project. And I, I understand that they went through the exercise of looking at um, uh, grid-fired natural, uh, grid, grid natural gas uh, as the power solution, um, compared that against um, solar, and realized, uh, sorry, a solar uh, or renewable PPA. Uh, and it was very much, you know, a price parity type decision. The PPA required a, quite a long commitment in terms of a, a power offtake, which was actually beyond their reserve life. But they felt confident enough in the ore body to make that commitment and source the power from the PPA. And, and, but it's interesting that reserve life is becoming one of the key deciding factors on um, that decision. Um, but I think that's also part of the, the, the general theme in the mining sector. Miners are looking to extend existing mines because it's becoming more and more difficult to permit a new mine. So there's more and more effort in, OK, we've already got this. It's already permitted. Let's see how many years more we can get out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, there's an interesting interplay there with uh, metal prices, with um, the financial markets, um, your ability to raise money. Um, all of those things are going to have an impact on it. And, and what we've seen so far is, it, if you look at the mining sector relative to, um, say, the adoption of renewables into in, into power grids, we're we're still lagging behind. But I think that's really about the investment cycle. There'll be quite a, a when, when the markets are, are more supportive, when there's more cash coming into the sector through higher commodity prices, through uh, a, a greater availability of finance, you'll probably see quite a, a surge in the number of um, renewables um, projects that one way or another get um, approved but because this industry has that cyclicality to it and the the investments are in, inherently very long term it, it really has to wait until you know the time is right thank you mark now the the, the general theme here at minds and money london this year is resourcing tomorrow so i want to sort of dive into sort of some into greater detail on some of these aspects we, we mentioned you know what scope to is related to the energy emissions of mines miners have been doing a lot of work on that They've also had a, a good focus on reducing their scope one mine side emissions. And now the, the emphasis is really, the tension is really starting to turn to reducing scope three emissions, which is those in the value chain, upstream, downstream. That's the tough one, isn't it? It's tough and it's tough to quantify. Where, where do you stop? You know, the, the, there's a lot of disquiet about how far up my um, value chain in terms of my inputs, my supplies, do I, do I need to go? And then how, how far downstream in terms of the, 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 the consumer good or whatever it is that gets manufactured from my product. And um, so you, those boundaries need to be defined. Um, and then you need really good defensible data on um, literally, in some cases, thousands of of, of different um, parameters. Um, if, because if you're looking at um, the downstream processing between um, the refined copper that leaves the 
copper refinery and um, the component that ends up in your iPhone, it, you can take fairly generic factors for the amount of carbon emitted in processing the copper through to that iPhone. But how credible are those intensity numbers really? Well, let's bring in SCARN into, into this a little bit more then. You know, SCARN Associates is producing its increasingly famous carbon curse for about, what, two years now. Um, and as I say, it's been, they've been becoming an industry benchmark in, in many ways. Um, so, and, and partly because you're independent, every, every mining company seems to have a, a different way of measuring things or interpreting the, the standards in a different ways, which creates, uh, makes it very difficult to compare apples with apples. An independent agency such as SCAN doing the calculations means at least everybody's treated equally. So you do have a basis of comparison. Um, is, is that a, a, what you're seeing your, your, your clients demanding or really appreciate about uh, the CO2 curves you produce? It, it is, absolutely. Um, and we see that as the value that we bring in, in that um, the greenhouse gas reporting methodology, the GHG protocol, is now quite well known and, and widely accepted. But even so, there can be some big um, variations in the way that's, that companies interpret them. And particularly when you start looking at it in terms of the carbon emissions intensity, so not just the gross um, tons of CO2 associated with a particular activity, but the, um, the amount of CO2 per unit of, of metal production, which is the way that we benchmark the industry and make comparisons. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things that you need to make sure that you're doing consistently. And are you, um, are you defining a, a, a consistent boundary around the emissions you're reporting? Are you taking into account the same set of activities from one mine or smelter to the next? And then also your production metric, are you gonna be using a straightforward um, copper tonnage or a, a copper equivalent? Um, that kind of thing gets really complicated when you're looking at um, a polymetallic mine, which may have five or six different um, payable metals and um, what metal prices do you use to calculate the copper equivalent? Um, do you, what do you do where you have complicated downstream processes with multiple metals sharing the same process up to a certain point and then being split off? So you have to come up with some really solid methodologies and a lot of the conversations we have are about how do you deal with that stuff? Um, and um, some great minds have been working on that um, and uh, we hopefully have a very solid methodology that lots of our clients are very comfortable following. Thank you, Mark. In, in the two years that you've been producing the, the, the SCAN CO2 curves, um, what, what has changed or improved in the mining sector over that time? What, what have you been pleasantly surprised about and what has disappointed you, you know, from the mining sector? What has really... Um, really felt good is the um, the conversations we've had with the mining companies and, and not just the majors but right the way down through the ecosystem have been really supportive and positive um, there's a tremendous amount of good intent out there um, the major mining companies in particular are a long way down this journey now, at least in terms of um, coming up with strategies to hit their net zero targets by 2050. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to how particularly scope one reduction is going to happen because that relates to fuel burnt on the mine site. And so we're really waiting to see how those hydrogen fuel cell battery electric big pieces of mobile equipment work and what the economics of those things are is or will be and we but we're getting there now we're starting to see um, some uh, some of that technology coming out and it's looking really really exciting 
Um, so that's been very gratifying. The other thing that's been grati gratifying in that regard is at the smaller end of the industry, the project developers, so in some of the smaller mining companies, they're very receptive to this stuff as well. There is still um, a portion of the industry that has not really um, woken up and smelt the coffee yet. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, that there's a certain um, kind of tier of the industry that just doesn't see this as a priority. Um, I, I'm pretty confident that will change because we're going to see things like um, carbon taxation, the European carbon border adjust, adjustment mechanism, making this a material financial issue and a, a material issue in terms of the marketability or acceptability of um, mined products in certain markets. And ultimately, all of this is going to flow through into um, commodity markets that have become more and more differentiated and stratified. Um, there will be a lot of products um, either penalized or rewarded for their ESG credentials. I think you're right, and this kind of leads into my next question, Mark. Um, in your most recent SCARM Bulletin, and SCARM Bulletin is your, your monthly publication that you put, about, uh, put out about ESG and carbon and water-related aspects related to mining, you took a look at the battle for Yamana Gold from a carbon emissions perspective, which is something I haven't seen anywhere else. And that showed that in, in losing the battle, Goldfields lost a tremendous opportunity to improve its emissions position or its emissions performance from about the 50th percentile. And I think it would have gone up to the, or improved to the 20th or 25th yeah. percentile, if I remember correctly. Um, does this show perhaps that, you know, miners and investors still don't really get it? I, again, I would think it's a very mixed picture. Some of them absolutely do get it and, and, and regard it as a, a, a top level priority. Some of them absolutely don't get it and really can't see why they should be so for me, one of the, uh, the, the, the possible outcomes of this is given your comments about you know, how the finance world is going, financiers will pay a premium for low carbon products and consumers will pay premiums for low carbon product products. Conversely, they may not finance high carbon mines or, or companies. So being 50th percentile and 25th percentile could be the difference between getting finance or cheap finance or not. Yeah, it could. And um, this is going to become more and more material. And, and there are certain financial institutions, certain, um, certain funds, certain PE groups, who we know are very engaged with this. And they look at their portfolios and they say, well, I don't really want to add that particular asset or that particular company to my portfolio because it's going to spoil my position on SCARN's carbon intensity curve. And, and that is um, very much part of their um, decision-making process. But there are other entities that just don't really care about that yet. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely happening. Okay. Um, what do you think will be some of the, the key things that we're going to see in the, the carbon space related to mining next year? Next year, I'm really looking forward to seeing how some of the um, big um, hydrogen fuel cell battery electric vehicle technologies pan out. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting we're going to see a lot more real evidence in terms of um, uh, how those things perform, what the economics of them are. Um, we're going to see a lot of companies putting out more, um, put more flesh on the bone with regard to their plans for decarbonisation. I, I think a lot of them are going to still keep um, a few costs close to their chest because they're quite nervous of themselves about how they are going to achieve those um, 2030 or 2050 targets. But I think we will start to get a bit more um, insight into how this is going to be achieved. Um, I think assuming next year is a good year for the industry as a whole and there's more money available, which is kind of a big assumption, but if we make that assumption, um, I think a significant portion of that is going to be channeled towards decarbonisation. And we've already seen some really, really exciting announcements from the likes of Anglo Gold Ashanti. Uh, they're putting, a, I think, 1.1 billion into um, decarbonising their operations in, uh, more rapidly than they'd previously um, 
announced that we're going to do. Fortescue made a, a $6 billion announcement recently, wasn't Fortescue it? Fortescue are doing some really, really interesting stuff. Um, and we're seeing real chunky amounts of cash now being um, committed to decarbonisation projects. And it's, it's going to be really exciting. Excellent. Well, final question. Carbit credit companies or greatest rock drummers of the 1970s? Which... <laughs> You're giving me the choice between talking about carbon credits or the greatest carbon rock Carbon credit companies. Carbon credit companies. I, no, that's a minefield. That, that is, um, I, I will share a small snippet with you. I was at a conference earlier this year where a bunch of carbon credit companies were presenting. And um, I understand from the moderators that they had to uh, make it clear before the start of the, the, the session that it was going to be... Uh, Queensbury rules, shall we say, because there's a certain amount of disagreement as to how credible uh, each other's um, carbon offsetting schemes are. So that's somewhere I really don't want to go right now. Okay, well, maybe we'll take that conversation offline. Mark Fellows, founder and CEO of Scan Associates, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much. And stay tuned to Kitco Mining for more from Mind to Money London. Kitco Mining's special coverage of resourcing tomorrow is brought to you by Discovery Group.